I'd actually like to start with a question, which is how many people uh, here in this auditorium spend at least one hour a day typing on a keyboard? Raise your hands. OK. Who would have thunk it at the Behance conference? Uh, let the record show that with the exception of somebody in the back who I think is asleep, everybody basically raised their hands. Mm. Let me ask another question. How many people here are faster typers than you were at this time a year ago? Ah, huh, OK. So a few people. You know, it's kind of strange. It's actually, if you stop to think about it for a second, most of us spend at least an hour a day. I spend several hours a day essentially practicing typing. Uh, and yet, I don't get appreciably better at it. We've always been told practice makes perfect, right? But obviously that's not the case. At a certain point when we are learning how to type where you know, it's real sloppy and eventually we get kind of fluent at it and then we stop improving. We reach some sort of an okay, uh, of a plateau. And in the 1960s, some psychologists helped to understand why this happens. And what they figured out is that when we're acquiring a new skill, we essentially pass through three different stages. The first stage they call the cognitive phase. During that first stage, we're intellectualizing the task. We are discovering new strategies to perform it better. We're making mistakes. We're concentrating. We're consciously focusing on what we're doing. And then we enter an associative stage where we sort of make fewer errors. We get better at it. And then finally, we enter the autonomous stage, which is when we say, I am OK at how good I have gotten to be at this task. And we essentially turn on autopilot and move whatever this skill is to the back of our proverbial mental filing cabinet and stop paying it any attention. Usually, this is a good thing. We are better off having the routine stuff of everyday life running in the background freeze up bandwidth so that we can focus on the things that matter, the things that are new, the things that are challenging. You can actually see this happening in the brain uh, as people acquire skills. Parts, regions of the brain involved in conscious processing become less active. Other parts of the brain take over. You might call it the OK plateau, this point that we reach when we say we're OK with how good we are at this, and we are happy to turn on autopilot. We all reach OK plateaus in almost everything that we do. We learn to drive when we're teenagers. And at first, we get a lot better. And eventually, we're no longer a threat to old ladies crossing the street. And then we sort of stop getting better. Uh, my dad, God bless him, has been playing golf for like 40 years. And I swear to you, I don't think his handicap has fallen a single point. Why is that? I would posit it's because he reached a kind of OK plateau. So psychologists used to think that these OK plateaus marked the upper bounds of innate ability. Francis Galton in the 19th century said, you know, people reach these walls that they simply cannot, by exertion, overcome. We now know that it actually has less to do with anything innate as with uh, psychological factors, what we consider to be an acceptable level of performance. So, you know, it used to be the case that people said nobody was ever going to run a mile in faster than four minutes. And this was considered an immovable barrier like the speed of light. And then in, in 1954, as probably everybody in this room knows, a 20-year-old British medical student named Roger Bannister ran a four-minute mile. It was splashed on newspaper front pages all over the world. This was considered an epic human athletic achievement. Less well known is the fact that six weeks later, a guy named John Landy from Australia ran a mile a second and a half faster than Roger Bannister. And it was a short matter of time before all competent runners in the world were running four minute miles. So like, what's going on here? Were people, did, I mean, it wasn't like people suddenly had longer legs or that there was some quantum leap in you know, sneaker technology that allowed everybody to suddenly be able to run four minute miles. What happened is when that four minute mile was broken, this thing that had seemed 
like an impenetrable barrier turned out to basically be a floodgate. I became fascinated with this subject of OK plateaus because of this kind of uh, weird experiment that I embarked upon a few years back, which is, well, I, actually, let me explain. There is a really strange contest that is held every spring in New York City, not far from here, at the Con Edison headquarters. Don't ask why it's held there. I have no idea. Um, where people get together on a weekend and compete to see who can remember the most stuff, the most lines of poetry, the most uh, names and faces of strangers, the most random numbers, the most shuffled packs of playing cards. These are not, for the most part, individuals with the most inspiring social lives. Um, <laughs> and I attended this conference, as, uh, this uh, event, as a science journalist, thinking it was going to be kind of quirky, kind of interesting. I was going to write a story about it. And I was surprised to learn that the individuals who competed in this contest claimed that they had just average memories. They told me that they had all trained themselves using this, uh, these, this set of ancient mnemonic techniques to improve their memories. And I was like, whoa, that's awesome. I want to do that. And I ended up deciding that I was going to try and train my memory. But I was like, if I'm going to do this, I want to figure out how I can do it as efficiently and effectively as possible. So there is an entire field of psychology that studies how people get to be good at what they do. It studies what differentiates experts who are the best from the rest of us. And I just dove into this literature, and I spent a lot of time talking with cognitive scientists, psychologists, people who study uh, expertise and skill acquisition to figure out, is there anything that I can learn that will help me do this better? And it turns out that these scientists have studied experts in, it seems like, practically every field in which human beings excel, from athletics to the arts to management to uh, people who are really awesome with abacuses. I mean, like, it really gets, it's, it's esoteric stuff. And what they found is there are a set of principles that are actually sort of generalizable that tend to be used by experts in field after field after field that help to explain why their practice results in them achieving this degree of expertise that others don't necessarily achieve. One thing that they found is that if you want to get better at something, you cannot do it, or it is hard to do it, when you are in that autonomous stage, right? When you are on autopilot, it is hard to improve at a skill. It is hard to develop expertise. And so one of the things that experts tend to do, again, in field after field after field, is use strategies to stay out of that autonomous stage, to keep whatever it is that they're trying to develop, whatever the skill is that they're trying to develop, in that cognitive phase, under their conscious control. That's how they conquer these OK plateaus. This, for me, was going to be like my secret weapon as I tried to train my memory. And I wanted to share with you just a few of the principles that I kind of mined from the scientific literature, uh, from all of these different articles about what makes awesome lawyers, what makes awesome basketball players, what makes awesome uh, abacus wranglers. One of the principles that experts tend to do, something that unites people across fields, is that experts tend to operate outside of their comfort zone and study themselves failing. So to come back to typing, turns out we can actually all improve our typing speed. It's not even that hard to do. Psychologists found one of the best ways to do that is to try typing 10 to 20% faster than you're comfortable with. Watch yourself fail. Yeah, it's really awkward. I've tried it. You like, write the most illiterate emails ever. Uh, but eventually, what happens is you start to notice. What are the things that, like, why is this slowing me down? Consciously, unconsciously, you begin to recognize what's causing you physical hiccups, 
uh, cognitive hiccups, perceptual hiccups if you're trying to copy something that you, you know, saw on the screen, and you begin to get better. We know that uh, from studies of figure skaters, yeah, there are psychological studies of figure skaters, that the best figure skaters in the world spend more time, of their, more of their practice time, practicing jumps that they, are, that they don't land. Lesser figure skaters, they get on the, the rink, the ice rink, and they spend their practice time doing the jumps that they land because they're more fun, they're more fulfilling. But the best practice the jumps that don't work. Same is true of musicians. Most musicians, they sit down to practice, they play the songs that they love playing, they like to hear themselves being successful, um, it's fun. The best musicians spend their practice time focusing on the really, really, really hard parts. They do rigorous exercises. Uh, deliberate practice is by its nature hard. Another technique that experts often use is they will try and walk in the shoes of somebody who's more competent than them. So as an example, uh, in chess, we know from studies of chess that one of the best predictors of how good of a chess player somebody's going to be is not how many hours they've spent playing chess against other opponents, but rather how many hours they've spent studying the chess games of grandmasters. Because right? what's going on there is chess is a series of decisions. And if you're sitting there playing against or with somebody who's much better than you, you get to see where that space is between uh, the decision that somebody who knows what they're doing made and you made. And you can start to figure out how to close that gap. And this is actually something that we can all do as creative professionals. Like, I, I'm a journalist. I'm a writer. There are writers who are, I'm not ashamed to say, a ton better than me at what they do and who I admire immensely. David Gran, New Yorker, that guy just writes the most badass stories ever. His stories always have this like, wonderful striptease of of details and facts, and there are things that he holds back and then reveals later. And it all seems effortlessly, effortless, but of course it's not. And what we can do if we want to learn how to write like David Gran is, all right, break it apart. Like, let's analyze. What's he doing? What are the decisions that he's making? Why did he choose to put this scene first? Why did he choose to reveal that the killer was actually this guy's husband you know, in paragraph 10 instead of in paragraph 2? What would have happened if he had reversed it? It's a totally different way of reading, but it's a way of reading that will actually help you become a better writer. And this relates to a third principle, which is experts crave and thrive on immediate and constant feedback. And an illustration of this is, is, is the field of medicine. We might think that the more somebody practices medicine, the better they will be, right? We would certainly trust uh, a silver-haired doctor uh, who's been on the wards for many years over somebody fresh out of medical school. And usually, that's a good intuition. There does seem to be one field where that's not the case. It's interesting. It's mammography. For uh, people who do uh, mammographic screenings for breast cancer, don't seem to get better at detecting cancer based on the, num the volume of cases that they see. Odd, right? Surgeons, of course, surgeons get better with time. They perform a surgery, and it either works or it doesn't work, and they get that feedback. They know what they did wrong, or they know what they did right. With mammographic screenings, the person who does that screening says, OK, no cancer. And it might be weeks, months, years, maybe never that they find out whether their diagnosis was accurate or not. This is practice that is not deliberate practice. So there's actually a practical implication of this. There's a professor at Florida State University named Anders Ericsson who suggested people who do mammographic screenings should be regularly tested with old mammograms. Show them mammograms that we know this actually turned out to be cancerous and see how they do. That way they can get that immediate feedback. Last principle is experts treat what they do like a science. They collect data. They analyze data. They create theories about what works and what doesn't work. And they test them. 
This is something that corporations do, right? This is something that governments, in theory, do. We, as creative professionals, can also engage in you know, best practices, discovering what our best practices are. And this is something that I did when I was trying to train my memory. I kept the most detailed notes. I kept a spreadsheet of like when I was training, how it was going, was I improving, was this working, was this not working, why might it have not been working. I made graphs. I totally geeked out. And geeking out is extraordinarily useful. I ended up coming back to that same contest that I had covered as a science journalist a year before. And I entered it. And I ended up winning the contest, which kind of sort of wasn't supposed to happen. Uh, I actually set a new, a new US record at the time by memorizing a deck of playing cards in a minute and 40 seconds. Um, thank you very much to whoever it was that was clapping. <laughs> it's actually, I, 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 don't clap for me. It's actually a joke. The, the, the best guys in the world can do it in 30 seconds. Uh, Americans on the competitive international memory circuit were like Jamaican bobsledders. We're, um, we think it's awesome, but they're like laughing at us. They're like, you're cool, but you, you suck. Um, so, you know, having gone through this experience, I think the thing that I took away from all of it, even more than the memory training or like the mnemonic techniques or strategies for remembering people's names, was, the, was this notion of how to overcome, how to conquer these OK plateaus. It's something that helped me a lot, and it's something that I hope can be useful to all of you. Thanks.